We'll begin with another word of prayer. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to open up your holy word, the Bible. May what we learn here today prove to be a help and blessing, as we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So you might have heard a funny story about Robert Ingersoll. He was an agnostic of the last century. Now, an agnostic is someone who knows there's a God, but doesn't like him very much. And so he would go out, and he had a, a very godly mother, but he would go out and he would lecture against Christianity. And in this lecture, he was lecturing and saying, you know, this idea of uh, hellfire, that's just an invention by Bible students to scare people. And uh, this, there was a guy in the, in the room there, and he was half drunk, and he said, make it strong, Bob. There's a lot of us fellas depending on you. If you're wrong, we're all lost. So be sure you prove it clear and well. Now, we do agree with Robert Ingersoll that the Bible does not teach that the fires of hell go on burning for all eternity. Amen. The effects are eternal, but not the duration. But today's subject is not hellfire. It's actually sort of a similar subject, the wrath of God. Is the wrath of God good news? There was a famous uh, preacher, his name was Jonathan Edwards. He preached a sermon called, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. An angry God? I, I thought God was love. How does this square away with an angry God? You know, I've heard some sermons on the wrath of God that caused me to cringe. <laughs> And I hope I can bring a bit of clarity today to a subject that uh, is not talked very much in the pulpit. Now, people often ask, if God is good, why does he allow bad things to take place? Why does he allow babies to suffer? Why does he allow uh, for there to be exploitation of women, children coming to school with guns and killing other kids? Suicide bombers, terrorists. Why does God allow these things? Why doesn't he stop it? If God is good, why doesn't he stop evil from taking place? Where's God when bad things happen to me or to my family? Well, the truth is God is doing something about evil. And he will ultimately Amen. eliminate the universe of pain, suffering, and evil. And the Bible calls this plan the wrath of God. I was recently looking on the internet. You might have uh, heard about this little girl. Her name was John Bonet Ramsey. She was a little beauty queen. She was six years old, a beauty queen who was murdered in her own home in Boulder, Colorado. They found her there in the basement. And the policemen, they botched the whole crime scene because they felt sure that the uh, murders was either the father or the mother. And so they, didn't, they weren't careful with the crime scene. They weren't careful in taking care of the evidence. And the result was is that the DNA proved later on that it couldn't have been the father or the mother. And so then 25 years went by, and the dad that you see there on the screen is still looking for the killers. And he's petitioned the state of Colorado to open up its DNA file of all possible suspects so that hopefully they'll be able to find the killer. Now why? It won't bring his daughter back to life. Lots of years have gone by, but he feels that just as long as someone is out there who committed this murder, he just has to do his best to try to find it. Justice. That's what he wants. Amen. And you see, the wrath of God has to do with the justice of God. What is the wrath of God? 
The wrath of God is God's determined opposition to evil and his ultimate resolve to do away with it. The wrath of God, imagine a coin. I'm going to call the coin the love of God coin. On one side of the love of God coin is God's mercy, is God's kindness, is his watch care over us. But on the other side of that coin is the justice of God. And you need both sides of the coin to make up the love of God coin. Now the wrath of God, the word wrath, by the way, is just a word that means passionate or great anger. Now God's anger is not like human anger. Human anger is we, we blow up, we, we fly off the handle, we get our pride gets hurt, and so we say things and we do things we shouldn't do. That is not God's type of anger. God's anger is this determined opposition that ultimately sin must be dealt with. That when he looks at poverty in the world, when he looks at crime in the world, when he looks at abuse, wars, terrorism, dictatorships, that ultimately God says, enough is enough, no more, this will come to an end. That's the wrath of God. In the Old Testament, the wrath of God is spoken of 375 times. So this is an important subject. In the New Testament, it's found in Matthew, Mark, John, Romans, Ephesians, 1 Thessalonians, Hebrews, and Revelation. And so we're going to look at a couple of instances, so hopefully you'll have a better understanding of this subject. First, we're going to go to Romans 1, 18. It says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Notice it says here, forget, the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness, and ungodliness leads to unrighteousness. The two go together. In Genesis chapter 3, uh, Adam and Eve, they rebel against God. And in Genesis 4, someone kills his own brother. Think of the spokes of a wheel. The closer the spokes are to each other, the closer they are to the hub, the closer they are to each other. And in the same way, the closer we are to God, the closer we are to each other. You see, if you think of the Ten Commandments, the first four commandments have to do with love to God, the last six have to do with love for other people. If you do not keep the first four commandments, it's going to be very difficult to also keep the last six, because they go together. You can always tell someone who has God in their life how. Because they love the brethren, they love other people, and they love the Lord. You can always tell someone who's far away from God. They're easily irritated, and they're always in the wrong spot with other people. They're always having a row with other people as well. So notice the order, ungodliness that leads to unrighteousness. The verse continues like this, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creator, creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them up. And three times it says, God gave them up, God gave them up, God gave them up. In other words, if people want to do their own thing, if they're determined to go their own way, God says, all right, go your own way. But the problem with God giving up is this gives an opportunity for supernatural forces to come in and to take over the life. God, yes, he stands at the door and knocks. If anyone opens the door, he comes in. But the devil's not like that. He forces his way in. 
And so when you remove yourself from the protection of God, you're open to the onslaught of the enemy. Let's look at another scripture, Revelation chapter 15 and verse 1. It says, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled the wrath of God. Now, Revelation 15, 1 is related to Revelation 14 that actually first speaks about the wrath of God. And it's over three angels who give warning messages to the world at the end of time. And so we're going to look at these angels. The first angel, the Bible calls it the everlasting gospel. He said, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. The everlasting gospel is the good news that God loves us, that Christ died for us, that he died on the cross, that we might have life through his name. So the first angel's message has to do with the love of God, the goodness of God, and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on our behalf. Amen. Now, the second part of that first angel says this, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. Now, this is almost a direct quote from which commandment of the Ten Commandments? The Fourth Commandment. This is quoting from the Fourth Commandment. And so, what this angel is saying is it's a message of true worship, the gospel message of God's grace, and also that we should worship God who made heaven and earth. And this is an important message in an age where evolution is rampant, right? The creator God who made heaven and earth. So the first angel's message is a message, is a call to true worship. Now the second angel, oh, there it is. The second angel is a warning against false worship. It says, another angel, the second one follows saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, or the wine of the wrath, the indignation, as the King James Version says it. So the second angel's message is a warning against Babylon. It says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Babylon in the Bible stands for confusion. It stands for all the false religions that try to take the place of the gospel message, that try to take the place of the first angel's message. So Babylon represents false religion, the religion of man. Remember that in ancient times, they tried to re, uh, build the Tower of Babel, a tower that would go up to heaven by human achievement, their own way they would save themselves supposedly from anything that could come like another flood because they would make it so tall and so high and what was the result confusion so babylon represents that confusion of all the religions and we live in a time like that i mean the religions of the world are as confused and as varied as you can ever imagine Ever, anywhere from well we won't even go into it but you know what i mean it's every type of thing. And so this second angel says, is a warning. It says, Babylon is fallen. And it's a warning telling them, come out of Babylon, my people. Then there's a third angel. The third angel says this. And another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in its image and receive a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink of the wine of God's wrath, poured out full strength into the cup of his anger, or as the King James Version says, his indignation, be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now this is the most serious warning found in all of the Bible, the scariest warning found in all of the Bible. Now in ancient times, it says here, poured full strength, the wine poured full strength. 
In ancient times, the water was very difficult to drink. I've gone to Israel and I've tried to drink that water, not tasty at all. It's brackish, it's salty, not easy. And so what people would often do is they would take one part wine and five parts water, and they'd make it a little easier to drink. Because anyway, regular wine in ancient times was very uh, bitter, sour, and not easy to drink anyway. Undiluted wine, it was bitter. But here it says that God's wrath will be poured uh, without being diluted. What does that mean? That at that time, at some time in the future, the mercy of God will be withdrawn and that it will no longer be pleading with sinners any longer. This third angel's message has to do with loyalty. Who in the end will you be loyal to? See, God is not asking for perfection because none of us have that to give. He's asking for loyalty. Who will you be loyal to? In the end time, there's only going to be two groups. There are going to be those who worship the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, or those who worship the dragon, the beast, and the false prophets. And the majority of people will say, you know what? I'm just going to go along to get along. It's so much easier to go with the big crowd, to go with the majority. And so, yeah, I'll get the mark of peace. Ah, I don't really believe in it, but I'm going to get it anyway. But there's going to be a small group that are going to be faithful to God. They're going to say, we don't care what the majority does. We're going to be faithful. We're going to be loyal to God. And loyalty, isn't that what we all ask for? Think of what we ask for our spouse. Do you ask for a perfect spouse? No. None of them exist. We don't exist. If you think you're perfect, you're very mistaken. <laughs> but we ask for loyalty. Someone who will stick with us thick or thin. That's what we ask from our children. That's what we hope from our friends. We hope from our, even our employers, people who are loyal. We're loyal to them and who will be loyal to us. And that's what God is saying here. People who are loyal to him no matter what. But there will be the vast majority, and the majority would rather have the mark of the beast than the seal of God. And at that time, there's going to come a time when the seven last plagues will come. And during those seven plagues, God will no longer be able to protect those who have chosen the mark of the beast. So we're going to look very quickly at these plagues and um, see what they represent. Now remember that this, in the book of Revelation, is symbolic language. So not everything is just exactly literal. This is a symbolic book, so these symbols represent something bigger. Oh, there's where do our loyalties lie. Yeah. The seven last plagues, Revelation 16. The first of these plagues is loathsome sores. Revelation 16, loathsome sores. Now, you get the mark of the beast, but then, on the other hand, there's a loathsome source. Now, these seven last plagues resemble the ten plagues of Egypt. And one of those plagues was loathsome source. That was a literal plague that came on the Egyptians when Pharaoh refused to let God's people go. The second plague is the sea turns to blood. That also really happened in Egypt where the Nile River, one of the gods of Egypt turned to blood. Now what happened in the plagues of Egypt was this. These um, plagues really were hitting the gods of the Egyptians. They worshipped the Nile. They worshipped frogs. So they worshipped frogs and God said, okay, you worship frogs? We're going to give you lots of frogs everywhere. There'll be frogs everywhere. Each of these plagues were really hitting an Egyptian god and how the Egyptian gods were not able to protect 
the people. And so these plagues are sort of, some of them uh, are patterned after that. The third one, the freshwater springs and rivers turn to blood. What this represents is in the last days, the, those who are in control of our world will persecute and bring to, and persecute and shed the blood of God's people. And in its place, the fresh water springs and rivers turn to blood. The fourth one, men are scorched by sun. They worship the sun, and now they're scorched by sun. The fifth plague, it's darkness and pain. Now this was one that also fell on, um, on the land of Egypt. And this darkness, it says that it falls on the seat of Babylon. Babylon itself, it falls on its seat there. And what's happening in the end times is that people have given their loyalty to Babylon because it believes Babylon will ultimately protect them uh, during the calamities that happen at the end. But first what happens is you have this, the uh, seven seals, then you have the seven trumpets, and those seven seals, seven trumpets are actual plagues, but they're partial plagues. But people's hearts have not turned, and finally you have the seven last plagues. And so at the end, the world sees, well, Babylon's not protecting us, and so they withdraw their support from Babylon, and the next plague has to do with that. Oh, let me just tell you a little bit more about this uh, plague of darkness. This plague of darkness happened also at the cross. You remember that uh, for three hours there was supernatural darkness around the cross where Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Did God forsake Jesus? No, but he felt forsaken because he had taken upon himself the sins of the whole world. And so that darkness represented that separation from the Father. Even though God was in the darkness beside his son, Jesus didn't feel it. And so Jesus experienced the second death for humanity. He's the only one who's ever experienced the second death, that separation from God the Father, and has lived beyond it. And so he took that second death so that none of us would have to experience it ourselves. See, that's the tragedy of all this. Jesus died for our sins. He gave himself for us. And none of us have to experience any of this. He experienced all of this for us so that we wouldn't have to experience it ourselves. And so that's why it says here in um, Hebrews, <laughs> chapter 2 and verse 9 he by the grace of God tasted death for everyone yes you might die physical death but the real death you just rest in Jesus thank you Lord you rest in Jesus but the real death is the second death that's ultimate that comes to an end but Jesus experienced that death for every one of us. So we don't have to experience it if you'll accept his sacrifice. So then the next one is the drying of the river Euphrates. Now, with this plague, now you really come to understand that these plagues have a symbolic nature to them. Why? Because the drying of the river Euphrates, let me show you, well, there's a little picture of the Euphrates. It used to be a very great river. The, what was so interesting about the Euphrates was that it's the river that ran right through Babylon. Let me see if I have a picture of that. There's the Euphrates. The Euphrates, you can see it's kind of dried up these days. This is not the sixth plague, by the way. Not yet. But this is symbolic language to teach us a very great truth. This is what it says. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Remember that little phrase, the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. So there's the Euphrates. And the interesting thing about the Euphrates, it's a representation 
of the drying up of all the worldwide civil, secular, and political powers that were upholding Babylon. Because the book of Revelation says that the woman, the woman Babylon, is sitting upon the waters, the Euphrates. Now she must be a pretty big lady that she can sit on the Euphrates. You know, the same lady sits on the seven hills of Rome. That's a big lady, can sit on seven hills. And she also sits on the, um, rides the dragon there. So this is symbolic language to teach us important truths. In ancient times, as I said, uh, the Euphrates went right into Babylon. Babylon was a city that could withstand a siege literally for 20 years. Why? Babylon was 60 miles in circumference within the walls. The walls were so thick that people lived on top of the walls and they would have chariot races on the walls. Impossible to penetrate. And so when Cyrus, this king from the east, came and attacked Babylon, the Babylonians were not even worried about it. But what did he do? The historian Herodotus tells us that he diverted the river Euphrates. He dried up the river Euphrates and went right underneath Babylon. And just as was predicted 120 years before by Isaiah, Babylon fell in one day. And so then it uses this imagery of Babylon to tell us about at the end time, the end time spiritual Babylon will also fall, it says, in one day. So that's the sixth plague. And the sixth plague uh, allows for the coming of the kings of the east. Who are they? Let me share with you. In the seventh plague, you have the earth shaken. There's a gigantic, the Bible says there's a gigantic earthquake. The islands all come together. And what is that a precursor of? None other than the kings of the east. And the kings of the east represent Jesus Christ himself. Mm -hmm. And the kings coming with him are all the holy angels that will come with Christ at the end of the world. So, uh, right at the sixth plague, where they, the the world systems decide Babylon, we can't trust Babylon. At that time, what happens is the Antichrist comes and says, don't worry, I've come to take care of everything. Don't, um, and we know, we had a whole lesson on that, that it's none other than Satan himself deceiving the world, looking as if he's Christ himself, and he comes, as it were, to tell them, from now on, you just have to worry about me. Ah, don't worry about the Bible. I'm here to tell you what to do, what I want you to do. And it looks great. He, he looks, he doesn't look like the devil at all. He looks like an angel. Everything looks so wonderful. And then this Bible says this prepares for the great battle of Armageddon. I can see I have a picture about that. There it is. The Battle of Armageddon. Armageddon, is it a physical battle? No, it is not a, a physical battle. There's some, let me see, I think I might have a picture. Sorry, I couldn't hear what you said. <laughs> uh, there. Okay, there it is. There is the Valley of Megiddo. You've probably seen movies of Armageddon, right? A great battle. I've even read books about it. Um, but if you've gone to Megiddo, you realize it's a little place. Modern armies could not fight in that place. The planes don't fit. The, the tanks don't fit there. It's little. But the important thing about Megiddo is that right next door to it, that's where Elijah had his final showdown with the prophets of Baal. And you remember the story, they had to choose. Choose you, who you will serve. Will you serve the Lord God, or will you serve the prophets of Baal? And there was a great a showdown, and God won in that showdown, the prophets of Baal were slain. And so it uses that imagery to teach us about what it's going to be like in the last days. 
So Armageddon. So it happens as the forces of good and evil are going after each other. And there's a terrible death decree. Then during that time, Jesus comes in the clouds of glory, which is uh, part of the seventh angel, the seventh of the seven last plagues. The mountains shake, the islands all come together, and what do we see? Jesus coming in the clouds of glory. So I ask you, the wrath of God, is it good news or is it bad news? Well, it's good news if you love the Lord. But it's very bad news if you don't love the Lord and don't trust in Him. I remember years ago, I had a friend um, whose father was a Seventh-day Adventist and a policeman in Colombia. And so, the, as you know, the mafia there is, is quite strong. And they went to this man and they said, you know what? We're going to give you a, a lot of money. We're going to give you a, a nice house. We just want you, you know, to help us out a little bit. I can't do that. Christian can't do that. Well, no, no, we're going to take care of you. We're going to take care of your family. And you're going to live well and, and all of this. Can't do it. I'm a Christian. Will not do it. So the mafia thought that this man was so dangerous that they murdered him. Now, during that time, he had a 12-year-old son. When he was murdered, his son was 12 years old. One of his sons was 12 years old. And so the mafia, they worry not only about the person they kill, they worry about the people that can take vengeance on them later on. And so when this boy grew up to manhood, they killed him too to avoid the possibility of him striking back at them. And so then there were other family members and sons that were here in the United States. And I asked one of them, I said, what, what's your family going to do about this? They said, we're not going to do anything. They had nothing to worry about with my brother. My brother's a Christian. He would never have done that. We believe in trusting in God. We believe in letting God do justice, not ourselves. And isn't that our attitude, my friends? When wrongs come our ways, when troubles come our ways, and we want to lash out instead, we trust in the hands that were nailed at Calvary. Amen. We trust in God and allow God to do His justice in His time and in His way. Sometimes God's justice is that God converts them. Isn't that the best way? You know, I remember, I'll tell you one last story, but this will end. There was someone who um, broke into our church. They didn't actually break in. Somebody left one of the doors, the church where I was at before in San Diego, many, many doors, the church, and someone left one of the doors unlocked. And you know, common criminals, they're good at checking doors. And they checked the door, the door was open. They came in and they made a mess. They stole all our AV equipment. They actually did other bad things that I can't say in public and stole everything they could. So when I came in and I saw everything that they did there, I remember kneeling down right there in the center and said, Lord, please, I said, do two things. One, find these people and justice be done. And two, bring them to yourself. That's what I prayed. What happened was that practically right after that, the police caught the guy, sent him to jail. However, he was a, like a petty thief that stole for drugs. And by the time this happened, he had already stolen, sold everything, stole the, our big speakers, and just a few little items were left. He had gotten probably pennies for it, but enough to get drugs that day. So, okay. So he was found out. The Lord answered our prayers. Then... 
about three months later, this guy comes to the church and says, I want to see the pastor. The pastor's here. And the guy is weeping and saying, I'm so sorry. I was the guy who stole all your equipment. <laughs> Every time I come by the church, I feel terrible. <laughs> this is a true story. I feel terrible. And, um, and I've done wrong, and will you forgive me? Yes, we'll forgive you. Anyway, I started having Bible studies with this guy <laughs> and his mother. <laughs> Isn't that a good ending to a very bad story, you know? So God, let God do it, right? Let justice prevail in God's way and trust him all the way through. And the people of God will have to do that at the end of time. Terrible things will happen, but we have to trust him that ultimately he's going to make all wrongs right, and that whatever is happening, we know that God means us good. You believe that? Amen. 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 Let's pray together. Lord, we want to thank you for your grace and your love. Thank you that even though uh, you love us, we know we live in a world filled with sin and evil and sorrow and death and you don't want that to continue forever. And we're, we know that that's the right way. Meanwhile, help us to be wise and good and help us to be loyal and true to you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.